All right, everybody, thanks for hanging out. We're joined today by, um, in my opinion, one of the most creative artists that hip hop has ever generated. We're very, very excited to have him here. So please, won't you welcome MF Doom. Peace. Hola, how's everybody doing? Good to see y'all. Thank you for joining us today, sir. How are you? No doubt, brother. I'm good. I'm good. All right. Um, we usually like to start, at least I like to start these things, by playing a little bit of music. Last week, we had um, a gentleman by the name of Young Guru here who does um, quite a bit of work with Jay-Z. He uh, was talking about some of his favorite artists and some of his favorite productions and MCs. And he talked quite a bit about you. And he mentioned an album, Mmm Food. And um, I thought for those of us in the room who may not be as familiar as others with your work, that maybe we might hear a little bit of that. Is that cool with you? Yeah. All right, so okay. let's start out with that, and we can get into our conversation. Hold on just a second, folks. Yeah, man. don't wait you know. for her, man. Don't wait for her. I'll tell you what, man. Come with me now, and, you know, I'll get you some lunch. I'll hook you up with something. I got a little back, you know. No problem. I hear you. That's cool. All right? It's cool. Hey, can't you guys just wait here about a half hour, man? Yo, I'll be back, man. I'm just going to munch up a little yeah. bit, man. I'm pretty hungry. Yo, let him come back. Here you will find food for your body, as well as comfort for your troubled mind. I'd really like some soup. Bread and butter. Of course, my friend. What happened to your hand? Huh, not Regular storage procedure. The same as the other food. What other food? Fish. Proceed. Rice. Boy, no way. Well, the cop got Next morning, I went to the store to get some food. Bread and butter. They arrested me. I'll save you. Thank you. Would you like a snack? Thanks for the drink. which I choose to give them. And that's for their own good. Believe me. I do do. They disappoint me. They must work faster. But the prisoner. Ah, uh, yes. The young traitor who is trying to turn my people against me. Watch him. I have special plans for that one. Rap, could lead to getting teeth capped, or even a reef for mom dudes on some beef crap. I suggest a change of diet, it can lead to high blood pressure if you're fried, or even a stroke, heart attack, heart disease. It ain't no starting back once arteries start to squeeze. Take the easy way out, phony, until then they know they wouldn't be talking that baloney in the bullpen. So disgusting, part itself as I discuss this. They talk a wealth of shit and they ain't never seen the justice. Bust this like a cold milk from out the toilet. Two batteries, some Brillo, and some foil, he'll boil it. You'd be better off in PC glued. And it's a feud, so don't be in no TV mood. Every week it's mystery meat, seaweed stew. Food. We need food. He wears a mask just to cover the raw flesh. A rather ugly brother with flows that's gorgeous. Drop dead joints, hit the whips like bird shit. They need it like a hole in their head or a third tip. Her bra smell, his cards say all oh, hell. Barred from all bars and kicked out the Carvel. Keep a cooker where the jar fell. And keep a cheap hooker that's off the hook like Marbell. Top bleeding, maybe fella took the loaded rod gear. Stop feeding babies colored sugar coated large squares. The art pier swears and God fears. Even when it's rotten, you've gotten through the hard years. I wrote this note around New Year's. Off a couple of shots and a few beers. But who cares? Enough about me, it's about the beats. Not about the streets and who food he about to eat. A ramen cannibal who's dressed to kill and cynical. Whether is it animal, vegetable, or mineral. It's a miracle how he gets so lyrical and proceed to move the crowd like an old Negro spiritual. For a mill, do a commercial for Mellow Yellow. Tell them devils hell no, say y'all own jello. We hollered krills, she swallowed pills. He followed flea, collared three dollar bills and squilt for halal veal. It y'all appeal, dig the real. It's how the big ballers deal. Twirl a L after every meal. Ooh. 
What up? To all rappers, shut up with your shutting up and keep a shirt on and lease a button up. Yuck. Is they rhymers are stripping nails Out of work jerks since they shut down Chippendales They chipping nails, doom, chipping scales Let alone the pre-orders that's counted off shipping sales This one goes out to all my people Skipping bail, dipping jail, whipping tail and sipping ale Like the doobie till it glow like a ruby After which they couldn't find the villain like Scooby He's in the lab on some old Buddha monk shit Overproof drunk shit, Buddha thunk it Punk try and ask why ours be better Could be the iron mask or the Cosby sweater Yes, you, who's screwed by the dude on the CD, nude We need food Thanks, thanks. So I guess just as this as a reference, can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, your process as far as, you know, when you make a song like this? Yeah, that's a good example to that particular song. Um, haven't heard it in a while, sounds good in here. <laughs> uh, what I usually do when I'm producing a record I'll come up with the beat first, mm -hmm. you know, then the beat to inspire the lyrics, you know what I'm saying? So in that particular example, uh, you know, it, it was it's really like the, that's the, like, I would say it's the, um, like the main song, that song defines the record, you know what I'm saying? Title cut, if you will. And, um, you know, so I, I, I came up with that particular song first and everything else spawned. From there, uh, you know, just a typical, typical joint. I heard the loop first, caught the loop, put the drums to it, you know, polished it up with the 808. Just you know, I don't, I don't, I really, I don't really overdo it too much. I like to just keep it close to the original as possible, leave something for the imagination, you know, but enough to tra get the translation across, and then just write to it, keep it simple. You know what I mean? Now, was that something you sampled off of? Um of TV or video, is, is music, or uh, is yeah, it came from else? a it came from an old VHS copy, like that my man sent me, like you know what I mean. Yeah. And what kind of equipment are you using on something like this? Hmm. Or is or is qu equipment relevant to you? Well, it really, it, you know, it, what you use to record, really, I don't think is that important. But just for reference, mm -hmm. I used the. Uh, MPC 2000 uh, XL, I believe, um, at that time, for the sampling part. Then the recording was on a, it was pre-Pro Tools, it was a VS 1680 or 1880, I, I believe. You know, um, like I say, the, the, the medium that we record onto, you know, it really, it, it, it's not that much of a big deal. It, it depends on the quality. Like, there's a way to keep the quality where you wouldn't be able to tell if it was two inch or, uh, you know, Pro Tools or, you know, sometimes you could record something onto Pro Tools and coming out of something that's an analog machine and it'll sound like you might have put it to cassette for us, you know. So, you know, I try to keep it as clean as possible, though, for, uh, for what I was using. I mainly try to just capture the... The way you hear it, I try to capture that same sound, no matter what, yeah. And how long does it take to do the, the, the kind of audio collage, you know, that sort of sets up the track? You got a few different things going on here at the intro of this song. Yeah, and I, you know, it, it varies. It takes like, you know, it's an ongoing process, sometimes months of gathering pieces, you know. Sometimes I leave it alone for a few months. And uh, it'll come back to my mind. I'll go back to it and find that one last piece that it needed, you know what I mean? And then when it's done, I'll know it's done by just the, uh, it'll just be full. But I mean, I really, I could work on it forever. You know, I can still, I'm still finding little samples and whatnot I can add to that. But I pretty much know when it's done, when it's, it feels like a complete, you know, you know, a complete piece. Yeah, it doesn't always have to follow a complete linear storyline, does it? Or, you know, do you, do you need, do you sit there and go, well, I need to find a voice that that says this type of line, and then I'll, you know, you'll put it in the back of your head and, and look for it later. I mean, yeah, that's pretty much as it, as it progresses. That's how it ends up being. At first, it's kind of 
it's kind of like if the piece is telling me the story. So I don't really know the story yet. I find like one or two things that reference a, a subject matter, a topic, you know what I'm saying? And then what happens is it will start telling me more and more. Then I, I'll join the conversation towards the end of the process. Mm -hmm. And I might need that one cherry on top of that one, like that one word, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I find it, once I start looking for one last word, that's when it starts getting tricky. I gotta like just, all right, it's done, you know. <laughs> you know yeah, that's, that's, that's been a recurring sort of um, point of conversation this last week or so, I think, with folks here. Just knowing when you're done with something, you know, yeah. knowing when to walk away and leave something alone, you know. Um, you know, I talked to you about five years ago, and I asked you what your reference points were to come up with these kinds of ideas. Um, can, you, can you recall? Um, you know, how you got the idea to, what influenced you to start doing these types of things? As far as audio collages, I think it's a real unique part of what you do. Yeah, um, the first time I heard something like that must have been like, man, what year was that? It was like 81 or something like that, maybe 82, you know. Um, we used to listen to these old, um, Late night radio shows, like, you know, same thing like how you got Bobito and them, them cats used to have the late night radio shows. This is before, though. This is like, yeah, 81. WHBI, there was a station um, out of New Jersey, I believe. And uh, it was the Zulu Beat Show. That's what it was. You know what I mean? And they used to just spin breaks. You know what I'm saying? But they'll have voiceover pieces on top of it. But then you have, like, funky drummer or you have like Apache rocking, you know, and you you have something like something from uh like an old comedy joint to be on there or like a, a Monty Python piece to be playing, you know. And um and I always found that real bugged out, you know what I'm saying? Cause I didn't know where it was coming from. I never, you know, it's something that you have to like a, another layer of digging, you know what I'm saying? So not only did you have to find where the break was from you gotta figure out, okay, wait, what is that? What did they get that voice, you know? So it, 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 you know, it always was interesting to me. So I always like to put a little something like that just to tribute that style, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, we had a little bit of that plan before you walked in, just just for kicks. Let me see if I can cue up something that has the essence of that. What we're talking about as an example. <laughs> at the Roxy this Friday. And don't forget, you can't bet. As we continue, and don't you fret, this is what's happening next. A red alert tape special. And this is Zulu Beats from back in the day. Moses went to the mountain, and God spoke unto him. Moses, 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 Moses. This is the Lord thy God commanding you to obey my law. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you, I hear you. Moses went to the mountain and God spoke unto him. What? I'm not going to make any shit again. Oh, Moses, why have you chosen me? What did you have me do for you? I shall give you my law to the people. Yes, Lord! I shall give you my law and you shall take the mountain to the people. Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! Yes, Lord! Lord! I shall give his laws to you like this. Hear me! All of you need the Lord, the Lord Jehovah, has given unto you the 15 10, 10 commandments for all to obey. So that gives you a little bit of an idea. That's, that's kind of yeah. what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that's a good one. I, I don't remember that particular show, but you got to give me a copy of that. Yeah, okay, you I'll, know, I'll take care of you. Okay. <laughs> um, so I guess, um, you know, this is so much a part of, you know, your performance, your persona, um, you know, not only sonically, but obviously, you know, physically, appearance-wise. You know, maybe there's some folks in here who are not, don't fully understand. Can you explain a little bit about the different personas? There's MF Doom, there's also Victor Vaughn, there's also King Ghidra, 
Can you can you break that down a little bit for folks? Yeah, well, the idea of having different characters to, you know, different characters, really just to get the, the storyline across, you know. Coming from one particular character all the time makes, to me, the story boring. I get that mainly from, from like, novels and that, that style of writing, you know what I mean, or, or movies, you know what I'm saying, where there's multiple characters to carry the storyline. It all might be written by one one writer, you know what I mean, or directed by one director, but there's, there's multiple char characters in order to, you know, it, it, you need it, you know what I'm saying? So the more the better with me. This way, I could come from one point of view or another point of view. They might even disagree on, on, on certain things. I think a lot of times in hip hop especially, artists get kind of pigeonholed into being like if you're the guy and that's, you know, it's kind of limiting in a way. So I look at it like, you know, I'm a writer, like the same way with the skits, you know, like have the, the record tell a story, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, have little intervals where, you know, it's like cut scenes, you know what I'm saying? To where, you know, yeah, to me, it, it, everything just flows better when when I got multiple characters to portray the, uh, right. the you know, the story. You know? Well, how would you define, um you know, how would you define Doom's character then? What is what is Doom's sort of, um, you know, what's his perspective? What are his characteristics? Yeah, the character Doom in particular. He's more like the old school, you know, OG old timer uh, um, villain. You know, like he's a typical villain that you have in any story where. You know, a lot of people misunderstand him, you know, but he's always looked at as the bad guy, but he really got a heart of gold, you know what I'm saying? And, you know, he's for the children, and, you know, you know, and, and, you know, it's like a Robin Hood kind of character. So he's a sympathetic villain. Yeah, yeah, loved by the people, but then the powers that be may not really get along with how he get down, you know what I'm saying? And what about Victor Vaughn, another, another character? Yeah, Vic is like... Vic is similar, but he's younger. He's more like a younger, like say 18, 19 year old, young whippersnapper, think he know it all kind of, you know. Uh, a lot of times he disagree with Doom, but still he looks up to Doom. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then what about King Ghidra? Ghidra's an interesting, um, is an interesting character. You know what I mean? The, the whole direction of Gidra is like, okay, he's not even from the earth, you know what I'm saying? He's from outer space, you know. And he more challenge he channels the information to Doom in order for Doom to produce and whatnot. So Doom is kinda he gets the message from Gidra. So Gidra is not even on Earth. He's more of a uh like an etheric being, you know what I'm saying? Now what physical form would, would Gidra take then? Is he is he human, or is he human-like, or is he something else? You know, you just straight reptilian. Like, he would be like a 300-foot, you know, three-headed dragon, golden, like, you know. It's from the, uh, it's actually from the whole Toho um, Godzilla films. So he's, a, again, it's just a villain theme, you know what I mean? The bad guy. Ghidra's that classic bad guy, and even in those films, like, you know, strong, real strong, where they had to jump them at the end in order to, to get them. They always end up somehow chasing them away, though, right? You know, because, you know, the whole hero thing, the hero got to win. But but if you really look at it, Ghidra is really stronger than all of them, you know what I'm saying? But he's still that oddball, you know what I'm saying? So why is Doom then more of your dominant persona? Or maybe not dominant, but the one that is more on the forefront? Is it because... Because you've said that uh, Doom, in some respects, is doing Ghidra's work, right? He's more like a emissary or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Yeah. So why Doom? Why is Doom in the forefront um, as opposed to these uh, other characters? Well, I think it's just for right now, you know, and what you know, what I had a chance to let the public hear, and just it just happened to end up that right now in this in this in this time frame. Doom happened to be the the one that's in the forefront, but I mean, in the next twelve months, Ghidra might take the take the stage again, and, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and you know, Doom might fall back for another two years or so. You know what I mean? So it varies. It's an ongoing story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I guess obviously, um, the mask is a huge part of Doom. 
Can you just, for those who you know, are new to this, can you explain a little bit of why Doom wears the mask, why he's only seen with the mask? Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, the whole mask thing, really, it, it, all right, it's a time in hip hop where things, from my point of view, started going more to what things look like opposed to what things sound like. You know what I mean? Before, we ain't know what MCs look like until we went to the party and seen them rocking, you know what I'm saying? Or seen them, you know, most of the time you see them rocking at a show before you even knew, you know what I'm saying? Videos. Yeah, before video, pre video, you know, so, you know, you really was going off the sound of the record, straight skills. See, once it started getting more publicized and, you know, it started being hip hop, started being more of a, a money making thing. Then you get these corporate ideas where you want to put what it looks like to sell what it sounds like. But we dealing with music. So what I did was I said, all right, look, I'm going to come with the angle of it don't matter what I look like. You know, it don't matter what the artists look like. It's more what the artists sound like. So the mask really represents the, the whole, like, to rebel against the trying to sell the product as a human being. You know what I mean? It's more of a sound. So... You know, and at the same time, it, you know, it, it's something different, you know what I'm saying? And it fits with the theme of the rebel, the villain, where, you know, to him, he don't care about the fame and all that shit. That shit is of no consequence, you know what I mean? It's more of the message of what's being said. So I think it, it helps people focus more on what's being said. And it's still entertaining. It's still like the theater, and it has the appeal of, uh, you know, something that could be considered entertaining, but that message is still there. That yo, you know, villain represents anybody. Anybody in here could wear the mask and be a villain, male, female, any race, so-called race. You know what I mean? It's about what, what, where you coming from, from your heart. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what is the message? What you got to say? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So that's that's mainly why I um, chose to bring the mask into the fold. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, can you talk a little bit about just you know, you just mentioned your first sort of encounters with hip hop a little bit. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you got into the music init initially? What do you mean, like, got into the music, hip hop in general? Like, just the... I think it was just from, you know what it was? My first, my first experience with hip hop, hearing the sound that we call hip hop now, that could be considered hip hop, it would have to be just listening to the radio. Uh, at the time, it was WBLS, like Frankie Crocker, but he'd be playing, he'd be playing joints like, joints from like um, Grover Washington Jr., and it just got that feel. Certain records just got the feel. You hear the break, oh, good times, she, good times. You hear it, even if they're not being spun, you hear, it, you hear it in there, right? Then, you know, at the time we was young, we was like, I think I was going to be like. 10, 11 years old, something like that, you know. And uh, we used to, you know, go down the block, and a lot of our people had older brothers. So this is back when it was two turntables and cats had afros. And we used to look up to them, like, oh, you know, go peeking down in the basement, like, oh, what they doing, you know? But I would never be able to really get on the wheels until it must have been like a year after, and they finally invited us down to try to just get on, you know what I mean? So. That's my first uh, uh, experience with what we would call hip hop now, you know, Tramp, Otis Redding, spinning, you know, just seeing how the record feel when you spin it back, mm -hmm. how the fader feel when you hit it, you know what I mean? So, yeah. Now, this is uh, this is in Long Beach or Freeport? Or, uh, yeah, this is in uh, Long Island, Freeport, Long Island. Mm -hmm. You know, is where, where it first started, I would say. And, and KMD uh, started out as a graffiti crew? Yeah, that's right. Well, it was really like a crew, basically. Back then, we used to have crews that was just crews, you know what I mean? That would listen to music, maybe be artists in general, break dancing, anything that was like, at the time, we didn't really categorize it like that. Anything that was fun, you know, a crew that you would walk home from school with, and that's just a crew, you know? And everybody in the crew might add one thing to it or, you know, bring a different angle to it. So graffiti was like something that we just did, you know, doodling and art in general, you know. So, yeah, it, it turned more into a graffiti crew first, and then the breakdancing came into it as that became more popular, you know. And then music was always there. Hip-hop was always there like, as far as the music aspect. 
And then, you know, it just turned out the hip hop part, sound wise, music wise, got more popular. Yeah. And it started to be, you know, something that we, I guess we more practiced that more. Mm -hmm. And it became to where we was making tapes and took it from there. Mm -hmm. How did you meet MC Search? A oh, big search. Well, I meet search. At, oh, I met search at a talent show. It was like a, a outdoor. Um, you know how they be having those like, uh, like an outdoor daytime party though. It's not even like a night party. It's like a a fair, like a um, like a, like you know, like a gathering in the community where, you know, people be selling different items and whatnot. But they had a stage, you know, where. Um, you know, they had singers, and anybody could just go up there and do their thing. You know, I guess there was some kind of structure to it, but he 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 had a performance that he was doing up there, you know. So I'm mean, I'm out there just wandering around, checking out stuff and whatnot, and um, I was with my other partner, and, and, I, and we peeped this cat. You know, we really we heard him first before we seen him. Right. You know what I'm saying? Somebody was rhyming, so anytime somebody's rhyming, it's interesting. So it's like, oh, who's rhyming? So then we peeped this dude, and he up there doing his thing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? By himself, solo. So. I think I met him later on that day, like, you know, through my man. My man knew him already, then, you know, he introduced me to him. So that's how that's when we met. Mm -hmm. And how, how, how long before you met Search, initially rather, um, to when he actually asked you to appear with him on, on a record? Because you guys have been doing your thing, you know, amongst yourselves, um, developing your sound, working on demos for fun and things like that, right? Yeah, that time we was just, yeah, time was funny back then. Interesting, huh? <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, it seemed like it was all within the same year. Yeah. From summer and around again to the next summer, maybe like 11 months after. Okay. You know? All right, well, the first record that uh, you appeared on is with MC Search and P. Nice for Third Base, uh, a hip hop classic called The Gas Face. We hear a little bit of that? Yeah, no yeah. doubt. I ain't heard right. that in a while. All right. All right, cool. Hey, yo, man, my label mate, Don Newkirk, man, step to him. Thanks, Search. And now for the Prime Minister. Lover gave it the first light. A grin shows a trick up a sleeve. <laughs> what a tangle web they weave. Deceive is scooper, find through fable. Say, let's make a deal at the dinner table. Put you on tour, put your record on wax. Trust me! Sign your life on the X. Your exit XOR, but what you really get? A box of new ports and Puma sweat. Damn. Text feeds and frowns upon e -miss. To give a gas face and drinks from a thermos. Sub rock could at you with a clipper. Gas face given. I beg to differ. Pete, that was real tough, man, but I gotta get serious now. Hey, yo, Don, step to him again. Everybody, MC Search. Black cat is bad luck. Bad guys wear black. Must have been a white guy who started all that. Make the gas face. But those little white lies. My expression to the mountainous blue eyes dip for my face and shake my skull cap. Dismiss the myth that evil is not black but opposite spectrum. This done by red man with horns on his head. Lay down the ill plan, got all his helpers. Said, make it snappy. Tell all the people that their hair can't be nappy. Blind and blue eyed, a dark skinned heifer G, a disease created by leprosy. Don't speak of bleach, bend them to right. Say it was night, way before the light. Put aside spooks, search leaves a trace of setup correct with the effect of the gas face. Next up, Don, a special appearance by KMD's Sev Love X. A gas face. Can either be a smile or a smirk when a pair's a monkey wrench to work one's clockwork. Perk it is built to the rim of my cup. Don't tempt me, you're empty. So fill her up as I'm talking coffee or cocoa. Is you loco? Cash or credit for unleaded? That's a no go. KMD and third base is this ace in the hole. I mean, soul. So make the gas face. Damn it, looks can kill. You look like your host was a ghost from your grill, but still. What's the new fad to recollect to a passing phase? The back gates to 80 decker for my label reads good. Street my habitat, there's no pick any card or no rabbit from my hat. Never a magician if I ever trick them. Oh, shit. Another gas face victim. There it is, yo, fellas, man. Why don't you step That's to the mic, man? Oh, for 80 decker. Oh, hey, yo, good looking out, Don, man. Peace. Oh, Pungy. Yo, who gets a gas face? Tony Dick gets a gas face. No gas face for floods one, two, and three. No gas face for Professor Prince. Poo -poo. But Bertini gets the big gas. No gas 
face for DJ Sub Rock. No gas face for KMJ. Hammer, shut the fuck But P.W. Bolter gets a gas face. What goes through your mind when you hear that now, after all this time? <laughs> Man, it's like a snapshot from back then. It was fun, fun times back then, you know. You know, you could tell, like, there's a lot of humor and a lot of spontaneity, you know. Things got a lot. You know, nowadays, I think things kind of got more serious with hip-hop to where it's like, it needs more of that. Wouldn't y'all agree? A little bit of humor, you know what I'm saying? It, it adds more of a, to me, that's how it was back then. And it, it was comfortable. It's not as tense, so everybody's not so hung up on who's the best. And, you know, it's, it's more of a fun thing. So, yeah, man, you know, it's, it's like a snapshot, like, a, you know, old picture, you know what I'm saying? But, uh, you know, that said, you know, I think it's interesting because there is a lot of humor and a lot of looseness in a song like this. But yet, you know, you guys are actually saying some kind of profound stuff too, you know? And I think that was one of the trademarks, you know, more or less, or is one of the trademarks of what you do, especially so for like the KMD stuff, which you, you know, we'll get through in a second. But, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about Zev Love X? This was you before MF Doom. What's the relationship between Zev and, and Doom? Well, really, I would say they both well, they both really exist simultaneously, so it's not like a change from one to the other one. It's more like one of them came more to the forefront now. You know what I mean? Like these are shifting positions. Like it still back to the whole character thing. You know, so Zevil of X still still exists somewhere as that character. You just don't hear him, hear him too much right now. He's playing the background out of the story, kind of like. So um, there's a lot of similarities, you know. But I'm, again, I made it to where I needed another way to 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 get a different point across. You know what I'm saying? A more, I think the Doom character is more, it's a little more serious, you know what I'm saying? More serious than Zev is. You know what I mean? It's a little more, a lot of people describe it, describe it as dark. I would say it's just a, a deeper hue, like a kind of, more reflective, like he, he might teach things deeper into things. Right. You know what I mean? Well, Doom has, has gone through things that Zev hadn't gone through yet, though, when, you know, as well, right? I mean, Doom's perspective is going to be different. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, you know, uh, you know, art imitates life kind of thing. So it's, it is loosely based on, you know, experiences. Of course, everything is going to be based somewhat on experiences but at the same time like i say doom always existed it's just when was his chance to grab the mic and actually make that mm -hmm. debut you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. you know the other thing with zev and the kmd era um you know not to stay on it too long but um also represented something you know that was very prevalent at the time which is five percent nation and hip-hop at the time and you know those things you and brand nubian you know were dubbed yourselves the god squad you know, it was a very interesting time for all that stuff to be so prevalent. Um, you know, any reflections on that now, looking back? Well, yeah, you know, uh, really a lot of influence to put information and in to get like uh, different aspects of the culture into the music comes from influences like, uh, like I would say, like PE. And when they was, you know, we was heavily influenced by PE, uh, BDP, you know, and they would, uh, they would speak on different things that you wouldn't really hear anywhere else besides maybe like, you know, 
an old gathering, like you know, went to a gathering with, with, with an uncle or something like that. Or when you got the old timers sitting around just talking about back then. It's something that you would hear more from family members or like through passing of stories, like culturally, you know. So in order to keep that keep that alive and to keep these messages out there for the youth, you know, we put it in the records, you know. It was kind of like unintentionally, kind of like just to be like P.E., kind of like, you know, like, if oh, what did he say? You know, oh, I remember that. What yeah. could I add on and, 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 and drop a jewel about, you know? Or to be like how uh, how KRS used to come with, with different information that you not, that you wouldn't necessarily hear. Right. You know what I mean? Right. But also adding this element of fun, too. Uh, yeah, and playfulness. Yeah. Right. I want to play a little bit of Cam D. I'm actually going to play, let's play something that's not one of the singles, maybe the intro from the album, because it kind of sets things up. Is that kind of cool? Is that cool yeah, with you? Cool. Okay. This is something from Cam D's first album, Mr. Hood, um, which can kind of, you can kind of tell, may set the stage for some of the stuff that came after. Let's enter this jewelry shop. Oh, come on, Mr. Vehicle Man, hook it up. 14K Duff bracelet. Man. You can't be. You can't. No, I cannot do that. Oh, this is not a pawn shop. This is vehicle jewelry. Ah, Mr. Hood, my favorite customer. What can I do for you today? I would like to see some gold rings. Ah, yes, we have these dookie fat gold rings, perfect for your masculine hands. Some earrings from my wife. How about these elephant studded diamond earrings, perfect for the woman of your dream? And a watch for my cousin. Ah, yes, we have a Rolex. That now, is a beautiful watch. 1,792. No, actually, it's 2,336. Please. Many thanks for I'm your so help. Tired, jerk people. My name is Mr. Hood. Oh. Hmm. What is your name? Yeah, I'm Zelma Bax from KMD. <laughs> I am pleased to meet you. Oh, yeah, likewise. Uh, yeah, how you doing anyway? Perfectly well, thank you. Uh, and you? Oh, I'm just chilling, you see, uh, but I got one problem. I come in here to pawn this bracelet. See, because this Robin for Nichols business ain't making it. <laughs> what I need is a job. Uh, uh, where you work at? Uh, they hiring? Follow this avenue. Yeah? Turn right at the corner. Uh-huh. Go to the left when you reach the square. Yeah? It is the house next oh. to the theater. <laughs> I don't want to work young. Yeah. Would you care for a spoon? No, I don't deal with They that. are not too expensive. As a matter of fact, this reminds me of the days of dwelling with those who killed off the weak for fancy clothes and hoes too. Not opposed to the picket fence dream, but both lie on the same side of the gate. It seems that it's all coming back to me now. Yeah, um, uh, I figured it was about two summers ago. No joking, no one I'd win, because it was a crackpot. Yeah, crackpot Jenkins. I first met crackpot and I could start. Since then, I knew he wasn't too head smart. And as I scribbled in art, he insisted on standing in the sandbox to collect unknowns amounts of pebbles and stones to throw rocks. This is an erisky, so when suddenly an early physics lesson, two atoms can't occupy the same space at the same time. It was by the playground's bully Wesson, who felt pots rock and crack pots face. Considering his aim, I warned he could hurt others with his game. Miss Christman warned the same, although he didn't care that he, cause in a decade and one year, he continued to throw rocks for a career. Paid him more paid as he cut rocks felt by every brother in brown with whom he dealt. One more rock thrown, ah shoot, under the brown was a boy in a blue suit. Still a lot of rock thrown going on up the block, but a pocket full of pebbles were locked up crack pot. Should've used his wrists for the cut like some rock. Maybe then he'd avoided the common phony jackpot. Yeah, phony jackpot. Yo, man, you got much better things to do with your time. Than Show that. me something better. Yeah, something better, man. We built this place, man. We're the gods of the universe, kings and queens of the planet. If you or I could see this individual, we might call him an impractical dreamer or a crackpot. No, I'm not. Would you have seen the scientific, intellectual, creative yeah, genius a... in a small, ragged uh -uh, Negro uh -uh, boy? Oh, no, you done set it off. <laughs> thanks, thanks. That's a fun record. Yeah. <laughs> a fun record. So, uh, all if anybody here has heard this album, it's it's this Mr. Hood <laughs> character um, right. is present through every skit. Yeah. What? How? Can you talk a little bit about how this was all constructed? Because obviously, this is the same source. It's the same voice from yeah, Mr. Hood, yeah. right? What? Well, where did you get this from? If you can talk about that, and how did it come together? Yeah, ironically, the record was is, is a language record, right? It was a Spanish language record that you know when you when you travel to different countries, they have you know records where, you know, and it was on vinyl, vinyl where they'll repeat a phrase and then say it in the other language. But it was Spanish. So it's, it's funny that I'm here now, right? But um, it was from maybe like that record was it was an old record. It was like yo recorded in maybe the '60s, early '60s, mm -hmm. right? 
And um, you know, I'm listening to the joint, I'm listening to the record. I'm, I'm noticing the phrases that he's saying. He's just saying some joints that's just funny phrases in general, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you even want to translate that? Like, I guess, <laughs> you know, at that time it was the way that the, the people spoke in like a slightly different different way, you know. So it was always funny to me listening to I just listened to the whole record, mm -hmm. you know, by itself with the Spanish translation on it. But then I noticed, you know, you can you can even mix match words, like all right, you know, edit there and kinda cut and paste different phrases in between it. Mm -hmm. So it started to be where I could see a storyline evolving out of it, you know, something that matched what was going on in the current current days, you know what I mean, what's going on in the street. But based around his character, he's like a stiff, like he sounds like real like like a corny old dude, but he's like a real real thug, like hood hood dude. You know what I mean? So the whole record was based around us kind of schooling him from being, you know, drug dealer type, you know, you know, just dropping little jewels on him and schooling him, bringing him into the crew kind of kind of thing. And by the end of the record, you know, we get him down. He kind of he gets it through his skull. He he starts being more, uh, you know, like aware of what's going on, more conscious towards the end of the record. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. It's funny because even just using that you know, Spanish instructional record, it just, it generates this like vibe of inclusion, you know what I mean? That um, I thought was real unique to this, um, to this record and to the group. Um, Skipping to the next record, even though there are songs off of this album that were hits, um, this album was very well regarded, spawned a few hits, um, Peach Fuzz and Who Me and things like that that are in the same spirit. Um, the next record you guys did, um, is entitled Black Bastards. Mm -hmm. This was recorded a couple years later. Um, this album, of course, for those who know, um, actually was not released when it was supposed to be released. Um, but it has a, a different vibe that I think is, is really interesting. Um, it's, it's got uh, a certain amount of, I don't wanna say, a little more aggression in it musically, even though it still maintains a playful side of it. And I liken it in a lot of ways. I don't know if anybody else has said this to you, but all the groups that came out in this era, De La Soul, Tri Tribe Called Quest, um, Brand Nubian, groups like this, mm -hmm. came out with very, very acclaimed debuts. And a lot of them came back with a little bit more jaded sounding records, um, but yet, classic records. And I feel this is um, one that is very much in the same league with those records, even though it doesn't get talked about the same way. I wonder what your perspective on, on it is. Hmm. Yeah, well, all right. Uh, you know, this, the second record really comes out of a lot of the experiences that we went through after the first record, you know what I mean? And that was our debut record, of course, Mr. Hood, where we were kind of like still wet behind the air, so to say, in, in the game. Like we, you know, business-wise, there's a lot of things we didn't know, and a lot of there's a lot of growing up you do. I think I was 18, 19 when I did the first record, so that's an age where you know it's real formative years where you're growing into manhood and whatnot. And it's like, you know, there's a lot of things about society in general that you, you find out and you, you know come to grips with. So the next record was maybe two or three years after that. So all those new things that we were learning and you know, a lot of the awareness that came out of being in the business went into that record, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So I think that's where you get a lot of the, uh, you know, the little edge on it. It's like almost like a little bit of bitterness, I would say, you know, in a way, a little yeah. like, kind of like, it's like a talk shitty kind of record, kind of like, yeah, well, whatever, like to the industry kind of like, a little bit like, yeah, well, fuck y'all. We're still going to do our thing for them, you know. I want to play a little bit of the intro to this album, if that's cool. Um, Garbage Day, number three. Where the hell's my goal? Where's my goal? Uh, damn, I haven't seen you two in years. Kind of a late visit. I was getting ready for the hay. Something to wake you up. It's not the three of us anymore, is it? N-O. 
It's a little more shit. intense, yeah. That, yeah, that joint. Like you see, it's in the same vein with the voices, but it's just a little more edgy there, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of that influence also came from um, the black exploitation films. Mm -hmm. You know, that's when the time when we just bumped into those. Yeah. You know, and my brother Sub Rock, God bless, he really brought a lot of this material to me. Mm -hmm. Like yo, yo, this movie is crazy. You know, it was Sweetback's badass song. That 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 particular film, yeah, um, yeah, Melvin Van Peebles joint. He brought that, and that that kind of set the tone for this record. Mm -hmm. You know, subtly, but that that was kind of the whole black exploitation thing, and then it spun into, you know. The, re the whole record Black Bastards. Right. And the theme of a lot of those movies is revenge. It's it's like somebody gets right. wronged yeah. and then they think that they're left for dead and then they come back and, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they seek revenge. Yeah, and they end up being, yeah, in those, in those films, the underdog or whoever was the guy who you probably didn't normally make it in Hollywood or didn't make it in those movies end up being the hero. So it was it was cool to see for a change, you know, those type of themed films, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And at the time when they were filmed and the texture of the sound was real, real memorable, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And there's also like a, a poetry record that um, is used throughout this, this album too, um, from one of the last poets. Yeah, that's right, that's right. The Blue Gorilla. Was, yeah, the Blue Gorilla, Gillen Kane. It's a real interesting record, yeah. Now, let me just play one short piece of the single from this, because uh, we want to get through this part. But, um, you know, this is your radio single, and this is how it starts. Hey, 
AKA King Gully's way. Cock a doodle do wake the hell up, y'all. Like a quadruple fat goose, I swell up, y'all. See your driver that leaps the soggy. I'm about to jump, kick your butt like me. I give no curls, no braids, but still wool. With my ill style, man, G's I pull. I lay lower than a limbo stick. Follow me quick, or leave alone a jimbo stick. Can, Can you, you dig, dig it? it? I roll rock. Clock me, dump me, my nigga will fly that nugget to the drum, y'all. Stung like court, y'all. I'll shadow box that ass and teleport, y'all. I guess shit, y'all. I like this, y'all. I like that, y'all. Thanks. Yeah, good thanks, good thanks. So that's you and Subrock, your brother. Yeah. Yeah, that's my brother, my partner, Sub. Yeah, um, yeah, that record was a fun record again, you know. But uh, that's when he started coming more into the vocal part. You know what I mean? Sub was nice, like, you know, he brought my skills up. You know what I mean? He was, started doing styles, I'm like, Dad, kid, you know. You know, it's always good when you got a partner to kind of reflect off. Uh, you know, it brings more out of the, out of the duet, uh, or out of the group when you know, you got a good partner like that. So you guys are sharing production and vocal duties at this point. Yeah, at that point, yeah, it took a lot of weight off me. You know, cause at this point on this record, the the third member of the group, Onyx, who was on the first record, he kind of left the group at this point. So. The vocals was kind of on me, but then he just took the, you know, took the play like bow. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. Caught wreck. Mm -hmm. um, this record, like I said, didn't come out when it was supposed to come out in '93, '94. Um, there was a controversy um, that those who follow hip hop probably are familiar with um, that caused this album not to come out. Um, what do you want to say in retrospect of of, of all that? If anything, well, um, I don't know. <laughs> the controversy, there was a couple of different things that was going on, and some of the things was behind the scenes, some of the things was more upfront, you know, but it all kind of culminated into, into the agreement that we have with the label to be severed, you know. It was kind of mutually agreed, you know what I mean, that we just. You know, it was kind of conflict of interest and like uh, creative differences kind of thing, you know. So then um, that's really what led to, you know, the record being shelled, as they say, or what have you. But, you know, to me, it's no big deal. It's like a process that, you know, it happens in the game where, you know, relationships come to a point where you split and then you do something else. You know, everybody grows and, you know, so it's that kind of thing. We just got too, to me, we just got too big and too outspoken for the situation, yeah. you know? Yeah, because the original artwork to this, and it's been reissued since with the original artwork, but it's the the character, the symbol KMD, which is the quote-unquote Sambo Yeah, character. the Sambo face, you know, drawn like, you know, drawn out, but then with the, like, the no sign, like the no smoking or no, right. you know. With the slash, yeah. Yeah, which will represent the ending of any stereotype or any kind of, you know, any type of false representation of of anything, really, mm -hmm. of any race or any people or any anything that's falsely represented. Mm -hmm. End of that. That was the logo, mm -hmm. you know. And then um, we took it a step further with the Black Bastard cover, and uh, and uh, and made it to it. Okay, now we got this this character on a hangman's noose, so we hang the character, which represents the same thing. It's the ending or the deading of that stereotype, you know what I mean? At the same time, it represents like the hangman game, like where letters are missing out of the, so it's like a puzzle, you know what I mean? So the whole record's like a puzzle, but at the same time still with the um, the message of uh, no more stereotypes, you know what I'm saying? So I guess it was a little bit maybe <laughs> too, uh, I don't even know. I can't even look at it from their point of view to to, to think what the the, uh, the reason was why they couldn't well, handle it. It seems like, like it was that. misinterpreted or whoever decided they were offended by it or it was too controversial, misinterpreted the meaning of all that. Yeah, but then you know what? At the same time, we had records out on the same label, yeah. like like Cop Killer, Ice-T shit, and like, there was a lot of controversial records at that time. I think it was more like, okay, is this, is this product marketable? Can we sell this? You know what I mean? Because if they could, if they found a way to sell it, they would have. It wouldn't have been a problem. There was even some rock groups on there. I forget the name of the rock group. They had something the same year. 
They had a cover with like a cross with uh like a Jesus Christ with a goat head and was real bugged out that maybe might some people might see as offensive or you know had blood all kind of looking crazy but but you know they selling millions of records at the time so it wasn't as offensive as you know you know so like I say it's a lot of behind the scenes things that that go on with this thing they didn't have a front story that you know as the main story as in everything they do even nowadays you know. There's always a front story, but there's also a back story, the real story, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it happens a lot in politics, it happens a lot in, you know, in, in how this world is run in, in general, these, you know, when anytime there's money involved and a lot of, you know, it, it tends to, to be that way, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So KMD gets dropped from Electra, this album doesn't come out, and then, you know, something obviously even more tragic happens, your brother passes away. How did you cope with that? How, what got you through this, this this time in your life? Yeah, actually, what how it happened was we almost finished. We was just about done with the record, you know, and then um, the an accident happened. You know, what I'm saying where where Sub lost his, his life and whatnot. God bless. And then I finished the record. You know, I still went ahead and finished the record despite you know because only it was a little bit more to do. So you know, just for the I mean, I'm going to finish it. One of us is going to finish it anyway. If it happened to me, he would have finished it. You know what I'm saying? You know, but then that's when they decided to uh, um, sever the agreement with us. You know what I'm saying? Like in that order kind of thing. So, I mean, a lot of things are going on at that time, you know? So the way I dealt with it, I just kept kept it moving. You know what I mean? At the time, it was it just seemed like another thing, another obstacle to, to kind of like maneuver around or, you know, I had... You know, I had my, my mother and everybody. I had to like kind of be the be the one to be strong at the time. You know what I'm saying? I'm the oldest out of all, all of us. He's my brother, younger than me, one younger. So I had to kind of like just take the reins at that point. I couldn't really think about it too much. You know, especially with the whole thing with the deal being different. You know, had to kind of like regroup and figure things out. So the way I dealt with it, just like how we deal with it, like keep it moving. You know what I mean? Um, you wound up resurfacing, but a few years later, um, with some with some singles with your friend Bobito on his label. Um, what else were you were you you were you were trying to keep it moving? You were trying to um, maintain, mm -hmm. obviously, during that time, yeah. that interim. But yes, just on the day to day, what was that? What was life like during those those years for you? It's almost like how we how everything was before we we started getting into the whole record. I mean, professionally into the game, like back to being a civilian, you know, so to say, where you no longer you don't have a deal. So it's like you you, you gotta figure out ways to make ends meet, you know, but still doing music, you know what I'm saying? Just like before we had the deal. So it wasn't too, it wasn't like unfamiliar, you know what I mean? Um, music is really what, now that I think back to it, music and having equipment and always just finding a way to, a place that you could just play your music and do your thing, whether it's my art's basement or, you know, wherever I, I could get something plugged in at and plugged it, you know, at the time it was the FZ1 and the FZ10 was the Rack Mountain version, a sample like made by Casio. So we, we had that, still, we still had our equipment, so find a way to plug it in and go, continue on so now that I think about it music was the was this thing that really kept 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 us and kept me going through the whole thing um you know and by continuing to just do the craft mm -hmm. it caught the air of, of Bobito you know so but he's always been there as like this is my partner one of my good friends from back when we first signed with our uh, Electro I met him through Pete and Serge actually he was working at Def Jam at the time you know, so uh, me and Bob was always cool. You know, so um, he noticed I was still doing music. I'd play some tapes for him, you know, go kick it with him here and there. And uh, he was just starting his label up or had the idea of this label that he was going to start. You know, so uh, he asked me to, to do a couple of joints, if, if, you know, if he could put out a couple of joints. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what, that's what kind of started it, you know, that's, that respawned the whole thing. But I think I would have still 
been doing it even now if if I never had a chance to, to come out professionally, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So at this time, did, did you guys, did you come up on your own um, re-emerging as MF Doom? Or um, is it something you discussed with anybody um, at that point? Because you were Zev Love X with KMD before these singles with Bobito circa 1997 for his right. independent label, Fondalum. Yeah, see, right after we finished the album Black Bastards, even while we was working on Black Bastards, me and Sub were both going to do solo records respectively. So I was going to do the Doom thing since back then. And he was going to come out with his, his joint as another character, you know. And uh, really, I just continued on with the ideas I had in my head. And I developed the Doom character and developed the songs and more of the concept around the character and uh, until it, it just culminated to enough that when Bob heard it, he got it, you know what I mean? And you know, the style was different. I came with a different lyrical style, a different, I tried to really make it distinctly different from the Zevil of X character. Like how you would have the characters in the book, like, you know, that different, you know, a uh, different strategy, you know? Like I say, it's about what it sounds like more than what it looks like. A lot, a lot of the experiences in KMD and with the, you know, that's when people do videos and everything was about, you know, so we got a taste of that and how it could backfire on you. You know what I mean? So it kind of made me go back to the lab and regroup. That's where I, I really developed a lot of the Doom character. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And as we've seen, you know, musically, all this stuff, um, you know, is really related um, just from listening to the early stuff, the KMD stuff, to what you were doing later. Let's hear a little bit from the stuff from Fondle and your early work for them. Yo, it's Dip try to tell him. Ooh, your life is on. Chasing all of the rain away. When you come around, you bring brighter days. She told me, you're the perfect one. Come on, you're the perfect one. Two, two, two. He told her, I will rock this microphone. Always. I hold the mic. Like niggas hold their girls tight, but I ain't after her. Probably your act of a pearl white, the hook or not. Nah. And many times down and hit it. Cause we specific more times and dimes in the prison. When you broke north, I crashed the barbecue like Riddick at the Garden True. That's the garden me, pardon you. Cheapers, I was told back. The whole gang access to my beeper. Call back my secretary gatekeeper. Like I ain't peeper. I said, darling, you was stupid though. You know the super villain. Home. I had this style ever since I was a child. I got this upper style, I ain't flipping a while. It goes your scientific intelligence, put one point of relevance. MCs who styles need elements. And once the smoke clear, tell them it's the super motherfucking villain. Nigga can't do war like the elements. On 99 plus one of them. And with a float to pull a fraud, nigga foul from out in front of him. When we were y'all, we had tons of fun. Me and my tons of them. Actual true and living sons of them. Dead planets and car jewels. Throwing divine rules to Come through, we will overcharge you. Ooh, and won't feel remorse for shit. Except for one time, once I had took my fronts out and lost some shit. Damn. Scientific on berserk, like red alert. I really want to pick up was nerd for cheddar dirt. The funniest experiments is where I went, obviously dead bent. And spent every red cent to rule you. And still drop more jewels than schools do. Or even TV news that's designed to fool you. Ooh. Yeah, you who hear the most grimy suggestions from brothers with fly names and ID questions. That's a sequel. Like Victoria Teddy says that's edible. Dunn's not ready yet for the incredible. Team of MCs who broke off fakes who thought they were slaughterproof. Stomping through like North Lake waterproof. Tat, tat, that's the end of that. At the hit the bar, where baby girl bartender at. I told her more wine mingling with no single mentions of. Stay tuned for more spine tingling adventures of. Appreciate it. Thanks, yo. Thanks. So these singles, Operation Doomsday, considered one of the you know, essential albums from this sort of uh, independent hip hop movement in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I always observed uh, from some of your singles, some of your work from this period, is you know, this is when hip hop really got super divided in terms of where your loyalties were, um, at least from a listener's perspective. It's like if you were, uh, 
snapping your fingers in the club listening to Bad Boy records, you were supposedly representing one sensibility. And if you were had a backpack on and you were bobbing your head like this and you know, in a cipher or whatnot, you were representing something different. Yet the thing that's always been interesting to me is when I hear some of these singles and some of these songs you put together, you're actually using some of these same reference points. You're just flipping it in a different way. You know, um, some of your songs are referencing Atlantic Star or James Ingram or Steely Dan or things that are super, would not be out of place being used in these other music that's being made that's more popular, well, yet uh, you're using it in a different, a different way. I just wonder what your opinion is of, of me putting that idea out there. Yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that differs is uh, the recording techniques and recording styles. Like, that's what we'll be making, you know, I think that's what it, the, where the line is. Mm -hmm. Like, we, like, they grew up probably listening to the same things we grew up listening to, yeah. right? Except their production methods and the, I guess the direction they, they wanted to go in was more of a polished, you know, um, I would say, you know, I don't want to speak for them when not, but it's like a polished sound. You can tell by how it sounds. It's like a, almost aiming for a certain, uh, like, a certain goal, like, as far as sonically and, you know, selling, selling records-wise, too, to make it a more, you know, pretty product, you know what I'm saying? Where, you know, we might be using the same sources, the same references, but I'm keeping it to where it's like, yo, it's vinyl. That shit might have dust on it. It might have crackles in it. You, you know, I, you know, I can't get the CD, so I'm gonna still make the beat. I'm gonna use the one I first made. You know, I'm gonna use the first set of vocals. I had a, a plug-in mic that wasn't maybe the best mic, but that's how I did the vocals, and that's how, you know, I'm keeping it rugged. You know what I'm saying? So, and we still use the same methods to this day. Like, however you, you do it, that's how you do it. It's done. Bow. You know what I'm saying? So. I think a lot of that, and that's an, it's an attitude too, you know, that 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 kind of um, that became part of the formula, and methodical, you know, methodical way we did did joints. Mm -hmm. It still exists, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. um, this also set off a period for you, just being super, super prolific. I mean, after being after disappearing for a while, um, you know, maybe not uh, right after Operation Doomsday, but definitely uh, a few years after that, you were. You know, there was a Doom record that was coming out every week on maybe ten different labels. Was that part of the whole, the whole thing? What was what was your what was your approach? What was your mentality going into that era of things? Yeah, I remember that time. It was like more of a, um, it was more out of necessity at the time, and out of uh, the popularity. All right, you know, see, like I say, we learned we learned a lot from the first run going through the game and having, you know, as far as the business side, having too many hands in the pot, you know, and not having as much freedom as you could have. But once you learn it, you know, that's when you make the updates, you know what I'm saying? So one of the things that we did was make sure we had control over the entities that, you know, we wrote as a control over the business and you know, not to where, okay, sign your, you know, sign a deal where you can only make records for one company, do that out, you know what I'm saying? There's a whole independent movement going on, so you can make a deal with somebody like, like how I did with Bobito. Like, he's, man, you know, make a deal, okay, do a one-off record. But it, it's not confining where, all right, your next record got to be with me. It's not all, like, corporate like that, you know what I'm saying? And I think it, 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 it was it was better for both of us like that, you know what I'm saying? We both were tied down to to unnecessarily, you know, having to be, you know, just confined like that. So what it what it freed up was it made it possible to solicit work to other other people, you know what I'm saying? So as much work as you can do, now I have the freedom to put it out. You know what I mean? So with the success of of uh the Fondalum stuff. Other other cats who want me to do maybe a verse here or do a record for them. So as many as and many people was coming to me, it's like I'm like, all right, yo, I'll do it. I'll do, you know, I you know, I had to get get back up and get this bread. You know what I'm saying? So you know, I had a family at the time, a son and whatnot. So I had to make sure he was fed and everything was straight. So this is where hip hop started being back like a business where I could 
sustain and take you know take care of my family. So any business that would come to us, we would we would we would take it and do it. So in the, in the outside, it would seem like we're doing a lot of records on purpose, maybe just to come out and have a lot of records out, which really wasn't the goal. I would, you know, it was more like as many people that needed a record, I would just do the record whether or not they put it out or not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But I guess on the outside, it looked like I was just doing a lot of records, which is cool, though. It worked both ways good. Did you ever con Were you ever concerned about quality control during this time? Being, Did you ever feel overextended from doing all this stuff? Nah, not at all. Like I say, I would be doing the records anyway. Like So whether I just did them and kept them on my shelf and nobody ever heard them, or somebody will come and want to put it out. And so, see, I got the formula from Bob. Bobito, I call him Bob, you know, it's my man Bob, right? We call him Wooden Tooth Bob, <laughs> right? So, so, so. Wait a second, we, I heard that you, I heard you and MF Grimm once, Bob told me once that you guys sent him in a, a, a sympathy card. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you yeah. tell him what the sympathy card was? This is a diversion, sorry. Oh, I forget exactly what it was. More, it was more Grimm idea. Okay. I just signed it, it was retarded. It had something to do with the Wooden Tooth joke, though. No, Bob said it was a sympathy card he got in the mail. And he's like, wow, nobody died recently. What is this? And he opened up and said, oh, we're sorry for your loss, your hairline loss. Oh, that's right. And you guys right. signed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was grim idea. I signed it. It was real funny. But, uh, but yeah, man. I'm sorry. Anyways, go ahead. You are saying you got the idea from Bob. Yeah, I got the idea from Bob about, yo, if we just put the record out, no picture cover, nothing, the people, you know, the DJs will buy a white label record and just play it. So once the DJs play that, people hear it. Then they, they, they either like it or they don't like it. So if they do like it, they gotta go ask the DJ, yo, what is that? Or they try to go look and see what the label is, or they'll they'll go looking for the record opposed to trying to force feed somebody a record like, yo, we got this new record out, and then they listen to it. You know, it's like it's almost, it's we did it the opposite way where it's up to the people what they like. Mm -hmm. So this way. It brings people to people come to you for looking for something that they already is, they're already feeling. So this way, you, it cuts a lot of the you know you don't get the bullshit records like that. You get quality records. You know what I mean. So if I'm doing a bunch of records, people know where to come to get the quality that they that they're looking for. So they'll tend to come. Over, you got anything else? Or do you got? So this way, we it's why we started putting out a lot of records like that. That's so why I feel like it's not really uh I wasn't it's not really like an overextended thing. It's more of a a niche thing. It's like certain people, you know, like certain things. It might be thrift store clothes. You know what I'm saying? That's their style. So they'll go to the thrift store to get that instead of going to Macy's to get whatever's supposed to be the high end shit. Mm -hmm. It's a certain uh certain quality that people look for, that we provide that same quality. How did you and Mad Lib decide to work together? Yeah, I got a call one day from, um, it was from Peanut Butter Wolf, up there at Stone Store Wolf, was a good friend of mine, Big Up Wolf. And um, he mentioned this cat Mad Lib. I wasn't familiar with his work at the time. But I guess he heard some of my stuff and he was reaching out to me so that we could do a record together, like, you know, and want to give me some beats and whatnot. So at the time, it was the same same time when I was doing records for a lot of different companies and whatnot. So, you know, they all had to fly me out to LA, you know, so I'm saying, they're like, good thing, flew out there, met these cats, cool, you know what I'm saying? Cats is cool from day one, you know what I'm saying? I got along with these dudes, you know, just good spirited, good hearted people and um, real record diggers, like, you know what I'm saying, beat maker, you know, had the same kind. We had the same kind of, same kind of vision, in how how we did records. Is the same, you know, it's real similar. You know, still unique though. He had his unique style. So, that's really how it started. He reached out. Ever since then, that's been my man. You know what yeah. I mean? They were all living in a house together at the time. Is that right? With the studio and a yeah, and the bomb shelter in the, in the basement. Yeah, yeah. They had a little mini mansion up on the hill. It was a pretty big crib though. It was. A lot of space in there, you know, overlooking the, the the hills. So it was a good good place to work at. You know what I'm saying? Real quiet up there. So what was a typical day like with you and Madlib trying to um, put this album together? A typical day. Well, were there typical days? Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, I can put it in a nutshell, you know what I'm saying? It was more like, okay, 
I'm trying to finish the record so I get back home. You know, I'm staying in LA. I'm trying to get back to my children and whatnot. So I'm working as fast as I possibly can without sacrificing the quality. You know, so but he's working too like that. Like I would hardly see him. We're in the same house, but he's always in the bomb shelter. And I'm always up on the deck writing, right? And then he'll give me another CD. I get the CD, and I'm writing. You know what I'm saying? And then he's back in the bomb shelter. So I would hardly speak to him. Like we hardly ever, you know, we might stop and he'll burn one and we'll listen to the beat, and then that's it. And then the next two days, I probably won't see him. But then I was getting mad work done, knocking it out, and um. And then at the end of the like week, we we'll listen to the shit out to the end of the week and be like, all right, you know, I might let them know, yo, here's the angle I'm thinking about. All I need is a virtual quads on this one and it's done. And then that's it. You know what I'm saying? I hardly we hardly spoke really. It's more through like telepathy and like we spoke really through the music. Like he'll hear the joint and that's like my conversation with him. Then I'll hear a beat and that's like what he's saying to me. You know what I mean? Like it's real bug. It's still to this day that's how we that's how we do it. Okay, okay. Let's hear a little bit of something from Mad Villain, which is MF Doom and Mad Lib. Looks like it's going to be a great day today To get some fresh air like a stray on a straightaway Hey you, got a light? now, nah, a Bud Light Early in the morning, face crud from like a mud fight Looky here, it's just the way the cookie tear Prepare to get hurt and mangled like Kurt Angle, rookie year The rocket scientist with the pocket wine list Some even say he might need some psychiatrist Doom, are you pondering what I'm pondering? Yes, but why would the darn thing be wandering? She's like a foundling, barely worth fondling. My posse's on Broadway like Mama, I want to sing. Mad plays the bass like the race card. Villain on the case to break shards and leave a face scarred. Groovy dude, not to prove to be rude, but this stuff is like what you might put on movie food. Uh, what is jalapenos? Get it like a whooping when you holler at your seniors. Dollar, he can overhear the hashish fina. He just came from over there, the grass is greener. Last wish, I wish I had two more wishes. And I wish they fixed the door to the Matrix's mad glitches. Spit so many verses, some time my jaw twitches. One thing this party could use is more <clears throat> blues. Put yourself in your own shoes and stay away from all the pairs of busted Tims he don't use. You only keep them to decorate. If you want to peep them, select a date and bring a deep check like checkmate. I kid you not on the dotted line sign. Ever since a minor, kids consider him some kind of Einstein on a diamond mine grind. She was dumb fine, but not quite the type that you might want to wine and dine. Couldn't find a pen, had to think of a new trick. This one he wrote in cold blood with a toothpick. On second thought, it's too thick. His assistant said, do you sick. He said, true through acoustics. Psycho, his flow is drowned in Lowry seasoning. With micro power, he's sound and right reasoning. It's easy as pie, 3.14. One more, one false move, and they done four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, yo. Appreciate it. Um, I want to ask you a little about, you always describe yourself as a writer. Even though you're an MC, you're a producer, you've also said, I'm a writer, you know, and the craft of what you do, I think, you know, it's easy to get lost amongst, you know, the records and the personality of the records and the mask and everything else. Um, you know, this craft of, of wordplay, of putting words together in an interesting way, um, maybe using this song as an example, um, you know, what, this song, for instance, uh, you say things like, groovy dude, not to prove or be rude, but this stuff is like what you might put on movie food. So obviously it rhymes, as most rap does. But you know, how do you decide like when to say something by not saying something, if you know what I mean? You could say movie food. Right. Yeah, I know what you mean. But something you put on movie food. Somebody, you know, in a past era would say butter or whatever. You know, it's a reference to something that's just a little bit off one step to the left, maybe two. And I wonder if you might address that a little bit. Yeah. Well, 
as I'm writing it, I, I'm also thinking of it from a listener point of view. So I try to make it to where I could catch myself off guard. Like you wanna you wanna keep the story interesting. Like soon as somebody thinks they know what you're gonna say, that's part of the essence of rhyming. Is to not is to keep everybody kinda off off guard a little. So I, I take that and I stretch it with these with these different things, like leave one word blank, you know, knowing that the listener is is following along and will fill in that blank, like how, you know, I'm following along and will fill in the blank. But always put the word that that, that you would least expect. Or what they think might be there is not there, but it still makes sense in another way. It keeps the story interesting, you know what I'm saying? Like where you can match wits with, uh, you know, it's almost like, like keeping a good conversation with the, with the listener, the way you can match with them, it makes it more fun to me. Mm -hmm. So I try to keep it as entertaining for somebody else who will be listening to it down the line, even and like you know, I, you know, it really puts it puts a sense of longevity to the record as well, to where you know you never know what what's, what you know what what the dude's gonna say, so you want to hear it again mm -hmm. and again, and then once you do get it, you want to pass it on to a friend. It's like a good book, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So you know, again, that's why. I, I phrase it as a you know a, a writer like you know I look at this it, it means written. I got the notebooks to prove it, man. You know it's a lot of writing, like more writing I thought I, that I would ever be doing. You know what I'm saying? So and it takes thought and a lot of like, you know, it's not just put together loosely like you know like a lot of, you know you got you got novels that are put together loosely and you got even got uh, um, um, like tabloids as opposed to uh, um, like like credible newspapers, you know what I mean? So in the same way, you got different hip hop, like in the sense of rhyming, that's some of it is just, you know, fun, like here and there, thrown together, mm -hmm. not as not as crafty, I would say. And then you got the real, the real crafty good stuff. So I try to make that quality good stuff, you know what I'm saying, where you're going to be like, wow, it's a classic book, you know what I'm saying, well written, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you did a whole album that we we mentioned earlier, mm, Food. Everything is a food title. Every subject is, on the surface, refer referencing food. Right, right. But then songs are not necessarily about food. They might right. be about something else. Double entendres, yeah. It's, just, it's all in there, you know what I mean? Um... I want to uh, make sure we get time for questions, so open it up in a second. Um, around 2006 to the last album you did, um, there were moments when there was a certain amount of unpredictability. You, you were very prolific, but then um, there, were, there was also some inactivity. Um, you know, what was going on at that time? I think it was more like, you know, I was still doing work, but I kind of laid off it a little bit. Just to concentrate on family and, like, you know, other children on the way. And, you know, I just kind of took a, a, a took some time off really for family and, like, just to just to get away from it for a second. It started being like where, you know, I don't necessarily want to do one thing for too long. It gets to where it gets boring and kind of overwhelming. And you want to take a step back and just reflect. So it was really like that kind of thing. I didn't think it was that noticeable from the outside, though. I figured it was enough it was enough work out there for people to still absorb, and mm -hmm. you know. And it comes to a point where, if I if, if I'm I need to get more information as I, I study, and you know, and you know, I got to do some some in some like to get to give the information. I need information, so I would do things like you know just leave it alone for a second and just observe the world and you know so i'll have more things to say i think a lot of times people expect us to just be constantly talking i'm the kind of cat i'll lay back you know what i mean and the conversation ain't always about what i gotta say you know what i'm saying sometimes it's time to listen yeah. so that was more like the listening time you know what i mean mm -hmm. um i want to open things up for questions for folks um even though there's you know there's a few more things to cover um just to kind of uh make sure everybody has a chance can we get a microphone uh I have a really obvious question for you. Um, All right. When can we expect uh, the next Mad Villain album? Uh, good question. <laughs> now, uh, well, it's almost done, I'll say that. 
Okay. Well, it's been almost done now for maybe like two years, <laughs> yeah. so two, three yeah. years. You know, um, I can't say when to expect it, but I'll be finished soon. I'll be finished by January, I say, with my part. But then okay. it's still Mad Lib has to put his little touches on it, you know. So it's still unpredictable, but it'll be soon. It'll be soon. Hiya. Oh, yeah. um, first and foremost, I just want to say that, in my opinion, Doomsday and Mad Villain are two of the greatest hip hop records ever made. Um, Appreciate it, man. Listen to them all my life. But, um, what, if you, I mean, I could probably ask you a million questions. One thing I've always wanted to know was on Mad Villainy, I always found I with Stacey Epps a really interesting track because obviously. 95% of the record is, you know, yourself and Mad Lib corresponding to each other. But then I always kind of wondered the point of the introduction of that track. Was it to break up the record, give people a, a breather? I mean, or was it just, how did, that, how did that record even, how did that track come along to step to the record? Yeah, that's a good question. See, the way, the way I, I, I view it, you know, I, I make records based on, the hip hop that we used to listen to, you see. So this would be like radio shows and like things like that. And I noticed the way the DJs do it, even at parties, the the party be rocking, you know, and it'll hit a certain point where, you know, they playing more more street records, and it'll slow down with more like funny records. And by the end of the night, they slow down with the slow jam and have something for the ladies. You know what I'm saying? Like just to add that feminine essence to it. And it always was a good way to smooth it and even everything out. You know what I mean? So, in the same way, I would always put something for the ladies on, on every record. Whether it's a female MC or a song about women or a girl singing, it needs balance like that. I think everything needs that. I mean, what would we do without them, right? Right, ladies? What would we do without y'all? You know, so that's where that came from. I said, all right, uh, you know, Stace is a good friend of mine. She was working on her stuff. And uh, she she was feeling one of the beats, so I said, "Yo, go ahead, do your thing," and and it just fit perfectly on there. Out of music that's currently going through at the moment, um, is there anybody that I mean, you've worked with Tom York, for example. I think even read this morning Johnny Greenwood as well. Um, I'd just be curious to know, out of up and coming producers, I mean. Obviously, the more established now, your Flying Lotuses, etc. Would there be anybody that you you know could call? That you'd like to call upon to do a record with, that inf that is becoming quite influential upon stuff that you want to rap on. You know, I really a lot of I don't really listen to to the, to the current hip hop to the point where I know who is who to say. Oh, I want a beat from this dude. Or I would like to work with this cat. I usually hear something and then I'm like, yo, who did that? You know, it works that way. Then I'll, I'll find producers like that. But um, if I had to say anybody, I'll say, uh, my man Kanye, he's doing his thing. That's a good friend of mine too. So I ain't get a chance to really work with him yet. So I'm like, if I had to say a producer, you know, something that people wouldn't really expect, I, I would say Con, Kanye, yeah. And last question, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I always found something really refreshing, the fact that you used a lot of 80s samples from Bob Skaggs or Anita Baker. I mean, I found that really refreshing in your music. I was wondering, would that have been stuff that you listen to a lot in general? You know, if you don't listen, obviously, to a lot of what's going on in present hip hop, which I totally understand because I personally think a lot of it's bullshit, but <laughs> I'm just curious is that you know music that you listen to a lot in your spare time? Yeah, I mean that's the stuff I grew up on. That's the stuff where I, I still go back to that stuff. And you know, I tr when I listen to these records, it's like the interesting records to me are records that's hard to decipher. Like, I, you know, technically, like I, I'm trying to figure out how they do that. What equipment did they use? What, you know, it's different from now. The methods that they use to record with, you could tell. Also, a lot of times you can't tell, you know, what they used. Was it two inch? Was it quarter inch? How they do it? You know what I mean? So those are interesting sonically to me. 
enough to stay in that in that in that realm and then looking for records of, from that era that I still haven't heard, you know what I mean? Like records from like say like Brazil, Brazilian stuff that still was recorded in that time. It's still new to me, you know what I mean? And it's still just as interesting, you know. But that's where yeah, it comes from that. Like uh I'm still in the eighties and in the seventies and the sixties. I'm like <laughs> stuck there kind of thing. But it, it, it's a lot of stuff there though that's still un, unfound, you know what I'm saying? You and me both. Anyway, thanks. Word. Hi, I actually have two questions. Um first of all the questions, I'm not sure if it was the reissue of Um Food that had the plastic, the silver cover, and if you scratch it, it smelled like chocolate. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that was great. Um, did you Do you actually come up with the concept while you're making the music, or is it something that comes afterwards? Well, the concept about the chocolate thing, actually, my partner from the label, Rhyme Says, my man Sadiq, he came up with that one just to celebrate the, the record, you know what I mean? Um, you know, yeah, so really that's how that came out. It came out after the record was out and like it's almost like an add on, you know, from the from the, you know, the food references like you spoke about earlier. That's like a, a, a reference he came up with that, that could make it interesting, you know. Yeah, do do you when you're making the music, is it only an audio thing or do you also sometimes have a visual aspect to it as well? Well yeah, I always have a visual I always see it and I hear it, you know. Just, you know, I always see things, you know, a lot of us do too as artists, you, you can see it and hear it. Things have, sounds have colors that accompany, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's always both, audio and visual to me. Definitely, and then my second question is, um, Rhinestone Cowboy is one of my favorite, um, uh, favorite of your songs. What, um, what kind of made you do the record? I mean, it was a, did you feed off the, the beat or did you have the concept in your mind already or how did that happen? Yeah, that's an interesting. That's an interesting um, record. Um, the way that came about, actually, the record was a little short, right? And um, uh, my man, my man Egon, <laughs> he was like, "Yo, Doom, I think we need one more song." You know, the, the, you know, the time he was up there at Stone Throw, and he was like the A and R dude. So, you know, I was like, "Okay, I need one more song." All right, I had so many beats from Mad Lib. It's like I could do twenty records. Like so many. So I, I went through them. Picked the one I, you know, the one that stood out the most to me. That was a hot beat. It stood out. It's like it wasn't tricky to, to rhyme to. So really, the the that song came out of just needing to fill the slot. Real spontaneous. Like okay, like I got like a week to turn the record in. Here you go, E. It's done. Like you know, kind of thing. So uh, that's how it came about. But I, I, a lot of this is one of my favorite records as well. You know, so a lot of times when when I'm under the gun like that. It tends to come up with uh, with that kind of you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I, I wrote it to the beat. You know, what I mean, it was just real quick, like uh oh, crunch time. You know, kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, it was a great pick. Thank you. Word, thanks. Hey, uh, do you ever find yourself out of ideas and how to work around that? And outside of music, where do you look for inspiration? Yeah, yo, yeah, a lot of times I find myself, you know, writer's block, you know, I get that all the time, you know, it's part of the process. When that happens, I just tend to just leave it alone and do something else and you know, and uh that's when I'll do something like I'll read or like uh I get inspiration from a lot of different things though, like nature, silence a lot of times. Just um you know, playing with my children, you know, things that people probably do every day. Some people might take for granted, uh, you know, little little things. The smallest thing will inspire something. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, when I when I get stuck, I just go back to normal mode, and then that's where you find things will come to you. You know what I'm saying? You know when to pick up the just have a a pen and a piece of paper handy, because it'll come to you. You never you never know when it'll come to you. You know what I mean? So you don't just stand there and force it to come. Like just wait for it. I, Lord knows I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, you know what I'm saying, but there's no way. The way the the, the way the creativity works for me, it 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 comes to you like it's an energy stream or something. Like it comes like in waves, kind of thing. So you just gotta be ready for the wave when it when it when it comes when it when it subsides and go back. That's when you step back for a second and 
you know, there's no way to really make it happen. You know, you just got to be ready, you know? Thank you. Um, you haven't spoken much about Grimm yet, so can you tell us how you guys met, the nature of your relationship, and maybe why things went sour? Yeah, no, I wouldn't say they went sour, but I would say, like, all right, we met at the same time, around the same time with, uh, when I met Bob. Like, it's the same crew, you know what I'm saying? All from uptown. I met Curious it's around the same time, too. And we all were, like, in the in the game somewhere. I met George up there. He was working up at Def Jam with Bob. And then Grim was doing demos and he was, like, winning battles around the same time, um, you know. So, and but everybody's from uptown, so I used to just be uptown, you know, with these dudes. And, um, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't say it went sour, it's just that relationships tend to split. Like, I don't see the same people that, you know, that you used to see every day, you know what I mean? Still my people's got mad love for all my brothers, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, that's how, that's how I go, that's how I went. Cool, I um, got another question about Pebbles, the Invisible Girl. She did the hook on on Operation, on Doomsday, and yeah. then on uh, on the mic. Yeah, yeah. But I've never heard of, uh, her, like, of, of her since then, or on any other records. Yep. Did she write those hooks? Cause She's like the those were, girl. <laughs> yeah, like, man. She, nah, but, um, those hooks changed my life, man. It's nah, like, you know what it is? I, she was the kind of singer that, all right, my man knew a girl who could sing, and again, I had to finish the record. So I'm like, yo, yo, you got a girl who could sing? Yo, ask her, could she sing this part? And I'll write it, or I'll play a reference. And she's like, all right, I can sing it. Probably paid her like $25 or something. It's like as a session singer to come in and do it. And uh, yeah, I don't know what she's doing now. I haven't seen her ever again. <laughs> I don't think I even know her real name. It's kinda, you know, but yeah, she You should rocked. be able to find it then, you know. Probably, maybe. Who's next? Uh, you said that your characters have conflicts. Uh, have you ever thought about making a record with the different characters battling it out? Yeah, there was. Uh, yeah, there was like. Um, matter of fact, it's a little rap beef starting right now with um, with Vic <laughs> and Doom. Vic is kind of plotting on. Him. I think he's getting a little jealous because Doom's getting shine. Like he, you know, so Vic is gonna come. Well, he's talking about coming out with it like a diss record. So it's gonna be a point where I, you know, just to make a kind of like a mockery or kind of like a spoof from the, you know, the hip hop rivalries that go on, you know. So Vic is gonna come. He's gonna come hard with some shit. You know what I mean? Nice. Thanks. So, uh, is Doom ready to respond? I don't know. <laughs> we gotta see. He's nice, though. I mean, I wouldn't go up against him. <laughs> we shall see. Um, actually, I think this is where we're gonna have to uh, wrap it. But um, you have anything you want to say to these young, impressionable minds in conclusion? Yeah, you know what I would say? Follow your heart. That's the number one rule. Follow your heart. Like, a lot of people might not see your vision yet. You know what I mean? People might call you crazy and think it won't make sense. Follow your heart. And, and just follow it all the way through. And that's when you'll see you making new ground and people will appreciate it later on. You know what I mean? Never try to do something to impress the next the next man, you know what I mean, or the next woman. Like it's really about what you see and you know, what you have inside, you know. Everybody's a unique individual here. You know what I mean? So you have something to contribute. So whatever it is, follow that and bring it out and share at the table with all of us, you know what I mean? And um I also have to say like just Thanks for all y'all support. You know what I mean? It's people like y'all that have me continue to do it and see a, you know, I see it as valuable when I, you know, when you guys show appreciation. I'm like, wow, you know, somebody out there actually listening to know what my crazy ass is thinking about. You know what I'm saying? So, so I appreciate that. I'd say thank you guys. Well, let's say thanks to MF Doom, everybody. Yeah.